listening to After Dark with Wes and Mark. On today's episode, we speak with Dylan Carlson of the band Earth. So you guys were just talking about, before we started recording, being banned from the sub pop offices and warehouses. Yeah. For taking merchandise. Yeah, we were. Uh, instead of waiting for our royalties, we were uh, <laughs> selling <laughs> product. <laughs> we were independent distributors of sub pop product. Mm. To the lo- to local shops. To local shops. And uh, it was funny at one point, uh, uh, this one record store, Cellophane Square, that was, I believe they had a couple locations in Seattle. Um, but oh, had, in the new district. Had stopped buying uh, directly from Sub Pop <laughs> because they were getting so many uh, were- CDs from... from us. <laughs> yeah, get a better rate from you. We were, yeah. under, we were undercutting. <laughs> we were undercutting right. our own label. <laughs> How about, uh, I remember when you had the meeting with Bruce one morning after we'd been hanging out all night long with, with Kurt. Yeah. And uh, I insisted upon going <laughs> and almost lost you your deal. <laughs> well, we both had a meeting. You had a meeting. And I had a meeting, so Bruce had decided to combine them. Oh, shit. And I thought I just went along and no, no, crashed it. Bum rushed your meeting. No, it was a, it was a joint meeting. <laughs> Did he have, so he had, he had one thing to say to both of you? <laughs> I got fired. <laughs> right. that, that came later. That came later. I got fired uh, individually. I, I got a, an amazing phone call from Bruce after it. After, uh, well, he was like terrified we kept trying to give him a ride and he wouldn't get in the car and then uh, he called me later and was like i'm calling you because you seem like the most rational of the two people and, and, and then he said i wouldn't be surprised if they found bodies under mark's house <laughs> and you said well that would be, be my, my house, house too, too. <laughs> Was rational. That was true, though. God, <laughs> I have to just admit. A terrifying thought. <laughs> <laughs> the most rational. Oh my god. Who do you think is the most rational now? Yeah. It's still him. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's, uh, it will always be. Right. I've come to grips with that 30 years ago. <laughs> right. <laughs> You've accepted your volatility. <laughs> yeah, I, I do have a bit of a mercurial <laughs> nature. Nature. Do you remember the first time you met Dylan? I do. It was at a Capital Lake Jam. Capital Lake. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it was. It was like 120 degrees. Yeah. And I'd come from Ellensburg with those shitheads in my band. You guys had the yellow SST van. Yeah. <laughs> Which was the carp. It was headstone, the carpet cleaning company's <laughs> name on the side. No AC. <laughs> it was burning hot. And I oh. I see these guys in this car with the engine running. And I know they got AC. And I just knocked <laughs> in the window. And I said, hey, you guys mind if I get in this car? And they were like, sure. And it was Dylan was in the back seat. And Slim. Moon, who uh, later started Kill Rock Stars, the label, was the singer. Yeah, and, and then did. our drummer. Actually, our drummer was Mike D's at the time, I think, instead of Heather. But Heather was there because she had a crush on Mark Piperol. Uh And then uh, there was me on guitar, and I think Kurt Flansburg on bass. Oh my God, that's right. And you're playing at a, a lake? Yeah. yeah outside? Like this, to 20 people? It was like this, <laughs> it was like an Olympia and it was like a fun fair. But right. And then they used to have bands. Like there was a metal band called Cypress. And then, although I think that was a different day. And then our day was Screaming Trees. And then Nisqually Delta Podunk Nightmare. <laughs> yeah, Nisqually <laughs> Delta Podunk <laughs> Nightmare, which was my band. <laughs> time and that was our last show 
first and last. No, it wasn't our first <laughs> show. Our, uh, uh, our first show is actually opening for the Melvins at the Redmond Firehouse. Oh, that would have been a fucking big show. And then, uh, uh, but yeah, that was our last show. Um, I just remembered that Slim was dressed as Olivia Newton John <laughs> in the uh, yeah the, the fitness video or whatever where she was yeah. pink headband <laughs> right he was dressed exactly physical like, yeah right. he was dressed like her in the physical right. and, and he also <clears throat> hardly let anybody get a word in yeah but Dylan and I kind of hit it off uh, when when Slim would shut the fuck up for five <laughs> seconds and. Uh, I, I dug Dylan's playing, and we ended up just becoming pals. Yeah. Did you know of each other before our meeting? I knew of the band, yeah. the Trees, because yeah. they were like, they were like professionals, like, <laughs> <laughs> like you know, they had like a tour van <laughs> and a sound guy, and I think you guys had lights then, even like. Uh, the Dope Brothers. Yeah, we did. <laughs> so you guys were like, ooh, they're the professionals. <laughs> <laughs> the professionals. <laughs> we actually had a little bit of notoriety because we were with SST, which at the time was sort of like the hip. Yeah. Do they give you a yellow van? No. Or that was your van? I, that I you... bought it for 800 okay. bucks. Yeah. It was a carpet cleaning van. And uh, Did they insist on putting the sticker on the back? Or something. No, I'm sure Lee Connor probably did uh, it just to advertise yeah. how cool he was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it, I mean, that was where our notoriety came from, was from him and from the label. Not because we played good music, <laughs> but because our guitar player acted like a 300 pound Angus Young. <laughs> Except, to my knowledge, Angus Young didn't like jump on people and crush their spines. <laughs> right, right. She had to knock his band over. Did he wear the, the schoolboy suit? He wore shorts. He loved right. shorts, yeah. Right, so that was the version of it. Yeah. His shorts, his button up shirt, and his fucking like knee. Yeah, the knee braces. Yeah, knee braces. Which didn't help him when I fucking busted his knee <laughs> in Germany. He fucking bashed me into the fit in the face with the mic, and I swung like an old school <laughs> mic with the ten pound yeah, stand, like, like Billy Joel. Yeah, like Billy Joel. <laughs> and hit and hit a home run, got him right in the back, and he went tumbling into his into his amps, knocked over his whole stack, and I just walked off the stage. A song, half a song in. Show over. <laughs> and then about 10 minutes later, he comes limping in and then spent the rest of that tour sitting in a chair. <laughs> this fucked up knee. And I should have probably told him, hey, dude, lose some weight. Your knee won't be as weak. It's not carrying around all that extra weight. Yeah, he was definitely one of the early progenitors of the chance. Oh, yeah. Look. God, that's but, true. But yeah. Permeated Seattle at that time. He forgot about that. Yeah, he was, he was a fashion, a fashion, uh, right, uh, influencer. Yeah. <laughs> and before before the term existed. And we actually, <laughs> coming from Ellensburg, wore flannel shirts our entire lives yeah. and had fucking trucker wallets. Yeah. Before we knew it was the thing. Yeah. Before it became de rigueur. And then of course I had to quit wearing all that shit. As I realized it was, yeah, as it came to, uh, it became, it became a thing, the uniform, yeah. Oh my god, when you can no longer be yourself, mm. yeah, it's probably a good thing that I could be myself. I would have, uh, <laughs> I would have, you know, been like Bundy. <laughs> <laughs> Out in the woods looking for the bodies I left up there. <laughs> right. I don't know about that. Yeah. We buried them under the house. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you already had the reputation. According to, according to Bruce, they were under our house. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That would have been under your house, too. <laughs> I got fired from the label when they invited me to lunch. And I showed up early. 
and I was just sitting in there and then in walked Bruce and John with a stack of all of my fucking real tapes. This is about uh, halfway through my second record for them. And they just walked it. I knew it wasn't a good sign. <laughs> yeah. They came in with the tapes. Yeah. And they just set them on the table. Bruce, like, looking at me with this shit-eating grin. He, he loved every minute of it. Right. Because you know they had a plan on how they're going to do it. Of course. Right. And John was like, Mark, you can have your tapes back. You can do what you want with them. But you're no longer on the label. And we're not going to we're not gonna pay the rest of your advance. And I said, <laughs> I said, May I ask why? <laughs> Even though that was the stupidest and most obvious question. Right. I had given them every reason in the book. Right. Like what shit. happened? Well, really it was because they were out of money. Nirvana had not uh, yeah, paid off yet. Happened yet. And so I was the first one to get jettisoned. <laughs> they gave me, for the time, actually fairly good money. That's why Dylan taught me my first guitar <laughs> chords because they offered me <laughs> enough money. I'd already been in the trees for like, I don't know, six years, made a bunch of records and never bothered to learn how to do anything. And then when they offered me, I think it was 13 grand, mm -hmm. <laughs> which was 12 grand more than I'd ever had in my life. Yeah, right. I quickly decided I'd best- Learn a chord. <laughs> yeah, so Dylan taught me the chords that I'd learned from <laughs> <laughs> my first record which I wrote in about a month and then I got Mike Johnson our friend from Oregon to come up and put middle sections intros and outros yeah. on them but the three that you taught me in various combinations was every song <laughs> <laughs> yeah I got dropped uh, uh, I, they, I went to a rehab in Wenatchee and then they were going to come pick me up and I was supposed to fly back east to do the sequel to Penistar and uh, in the eight hours after, uh, from my discharge from rehab in Wenatchee to when the car showed up to get me I had managed to become intoxicated again. In Wenatchee? Yeah. <laughs> Eastern Washington? <laughs> yeah. I, I thought it would be impossible to score in Spokane. I scored in like five minutes. Yeah, well, I mean, I got, I mean, the, I was in, one of the guys I was in rehab was like the biggest like coke dealer in Wenatchee awesome. and like he took a <laughs> right. shine to me. So like, he had to go do some time. So he loaned me his car and his trailer. So I was like living in Wenatchee. Oh my God. And like every time I'd drive it, all these people would show up thinking right. it was him. The ice so, cream man. I was, I was connected <laughs> right. rather quickly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, they showed up and let, just left me in Wenatchee. It was my, my uh, you lasted a lot longer than me. And then uh, I was in Wenatchee for like I think six weeks, and then uh, my girlfriend at the time came and took me to Ellensburg, and then back to Seattle. Ellensburg, that'd be my hometown. Yeah, where she was from. Or where she lived, I guess. Where she lived from there. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually from there, <laughs> which is worse <laughs> than just living there for a while. I can't believe I almost moved there. I thought you did move there. Yeah, I did, but I didn't last very long because, like, this one friend of my girlfriend's dad was, like, an old doper and... So he would be like, oh, can you go back to Seattle and score? So I have spent most of my time on the gray album. <laughs> I was going back to Seattle and coming back. I finally had to go on a day. Just I just like, fuck it. Just made it. Seattle. Yeah, right. <laughs> was that before you guys lived together or after? That was between. Uh, between stints. Between, yeah, because like, we lived together when he was doing his first solo album. And I had just done... You had the just, first album yeah. for Earth and was getting ready for Earth 2. We lived together and then... A gigantic three-story dilapidated old mansion. Yeah, in Green Lake that was infested with rats. Fuck and, the rats. Is it just you two? No, no. there was a Slim. cast of characters. Uh, Slim, Nate, 
from Ellensburg. The guy John that worked with us. John. At uh, Joe Preston. Joe Preston. Oh my God. <laughs> what, he, for a short time, he was in the Melvins, and uh, yeah. One day I was up, and I had the third floor, the very top of the house. I had the, the room up there, and I was up there trying to sleep in the daytime, and I hear this blood curdling scream. Yeah. I come running downstairs all the way down the fucking, all the way down three flights of stairs, and there's Joe Preston standing there in the living room, infuriated with this letter in his hand. Yeah. And I said, "What the fuck's going on, Joe? You okay?" And he's like, "My fucking dad sent me this letter," and I said, "What did it say?" <coughs> Fuck, I don't know. I didn't open it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Joe was round, well, really tight. Oh, my God. And then he'd sit and play solitaire uh, and eat strawberry Pop-Tarts and pine for goth girls. That he would never, ever have a chance yeah. of even fucking coming close to. Because it was before the whole goth metal kind of right. crossover that occurred. Before the Deftones hit. <laughs> before uh, Typo Negative. Right. But, uh, yeah. Do you guys ever make music together then? With Joe? Uh, no, you know you two. Oh, oh like, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, other than me like, making fun of D and the songs. I mean, that's how I wrote. Yeah, I mean, record. yeah, I mean, other than like me not actually being like an instruct, like you know, showing him some chords. But no recordings, really. No, no. But he was also the muse for all the songs. My first record. Yeah. We didn't have a TV or anything. And we'd just sit around. And I would actually like play these chords and make up songs yeah. in the room with him. Yeah. And Slim would often be there too. Yeah, I'd give like lessons. Positive feedback. Positive <laughs> feedback, <laughs> even though the songs would begin as joke songs with yeah. him starring and all. <laughs> <laughs> and then I did come up with one title, but uh, Juarez. Oh, yeah. Give me Juarez. It's true. How long was Dylan your muse for? <laughs> He's still my muse. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> I would no, and I actually do every single song I think I've ever written starts as a joke. <laughs> That's it, just like depends on who's there. Yeah. You know. And if nobody's there then You I, laugh at yourself? I laugh to myself. Right. I, I chuckle at my <laughs> at my wit. Yeah. And my guitar skills and think like Barrett Martin it's too weird <laughs> <laughs> it's just too weird <laughs> Barrett Martin was the last drummer in my, in my band the trees I came walking on the bus one day <laughs> and as I walked by he was sitting <laughs> he was sitting in a chair with his with this snifter of brandy <laughs> like yeah legs crossed like that and actually you know yeah. held like that no right. holding at all like this and as i walked by i said it's too weird and i said excuse me <laughs> he said it's too weird i said what's too weird <laughs> a rock drummer that listens to old jazz and blues it's just too weird <laughs> Was that the last you ever saw of him? <laughs> I wish to God I had been, yeah. but no, it wasn't. I actually <laughs> still still get emails from him to this day, occasionally. Yeah, wow. Uh, that was, and he was the um, he was the I want to say how, how do I put it? He was the closest. <laughs> To somebody that I could relate to, <laughs> <laughs> fucking band. That's the sad part. <laughs> yeah, it was the least unbearable. Uh, yeah, right. it was the least unbearable. And it, shall, I, shall I repeat that? And what happened there? <laughs> Just to give you an idea of how unbearable things were. <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's too weird. <laughs> What's too weird? <laughs> it's too weird. <laughs> What's too weird? It's too weird. You wouldn't understand. <laughs> A rock drummer. This is still jazz and blues. It's too weird. Yeah. Never heard of that. Oh my God. 
Yeah, it was too fucking weird. That was a 15-year sentence. So. <laughs> Damn. 15 years. Well, fast forward, pretty much parole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What are you guys working on now? Well, you you played on Mark's last record. Yeah, yeah. As, um, as did you. Yeah, actually, that's, well, I guess that's where, where we met. met. But is that the first, like, actual recording on a finished song? Uh, I actually was on the Earth record. Yeah, okay. so Mark was on the Earth record on Primitive and Deadly, did two songs, and then... Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, it's kind of weird. We sort of meant to work together many times, but yeah. never quite... Instead, we were too busy working together on <laughs> <Right>. more nefarious <laughs> schemes. <laughs> but, That's why Snyder was there, too. Yeah. He, he, it, sh- he showed up because we were be, supposed to be working yeah. on music together yeah. instead. Reminded you. <laughs> <laughs> but then after that, I mean, like, you know, like, you know. As we came out of our, our, our stupors, yeah. uh, our careers were just sort of like, Dead in the water. <laughs> like <laughs> running in parallel, I guess, and like yeah, it was always hard to like schedule right. stuff because like you know, and we're, also we're both like touring all the time. And, yeah, right. And we stopped living in the same yeah town town as well. You do you live in L- in LA area now? Yeah, I moved to that back. I moved down here in February. I lived down here for a little while back in the late '90s, the the lost years, and uh, when well, that time you jumped the fence when I came to pick yeah. you up in Pasadena. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what happened? Oh, a rehab escape. Wow. <laughs> and then, Were you the escape car? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, unwittingly. <laughs> I just uh, I was coming to pay a visit and then I jumped right. over a chain link fence. And then I had to make it dramatic. <laughs> Even though you could have just walked out the yeah, door. I had to jump over the fence. <laughs> that was so the second good. time I'd done that, too. The first time I was. You had practice. This other guy that I became friends with was leaving. And so he was had to go out he went out the front and had to like deal with like you know them trying to talk him down and i was supposed to meet him on the corner at the, when he got the cab so i like climbed out the window you know did the sheets and climbed out the window and then i got to the corner and he had already bailed so then I had to climb back. <laughs> of the sheets <laughs> and then like nothing had happened and then it was funny because then by the time he got home his lawyer was waiting for him to inform him like you don't understand dude like the police are on their way here if you don't get back into rehab you're going to jail so right. he was back shortly there after right. his law. yeah when you've, uh, when you've got deferred prosecution and yeah. then you fuck it up, it's uh, <laughs> yeah, becomes sobering real quick. Yeah, then the, the idea of escaping is less less uh, attractive. Attractive. Yeah, so. because there is no escaping at the next level. Uh, yeah, at the next level, you're not going <laughs> to climb out the window on the sheets. No, right. if I had climbed back up, I was just thinking if I had climbed back up the sheets, they would have come undone mm-hmm. when I was like right, right. at the top. Broken back. I'd have fallen to the ground. Right. Yeah, that, that thought did cross my mind. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't sound easy going up the sheets. No, especially when you're like, you know, just off recently withdrawn <laughs> you're having seizures <laughs> like are not in your best shape i was thinking how did you knot those sheets together yeah that's incredible <laughs> iron will <laughs> i probably had help because uh, my roommate was a former bank robber so he probably helped me right. and oddly enough dylan's Nickname has always been Iron Will. <laughs> <laughs> Doing Iron Will Carlson. You, you got that when you were um, panning for gold right? first. <laughs> <laughs> My old Iron Will. His, his patch is upstream. Right. <laughs> so, what do you got going, man? 
Like you did some uh, movie stuff or? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I came, that's one of the reasons I came to LA is uh, back in October I did a soundtrack for uh, Gilbert Trejo's first feature, um, which was supposed to be released this year, but obviously right. has not been um, and was going to be in some festivals which obviously those didn't happen. So um, I'm not sure when it'll be released at this point. Um, I'm assuming they're, I'm assuming he's holding it to be at some festivals when those right. occur again, I guess. Um, Weren't you done something else with Gilbert recently? Um, yeah, I've acted in a video he directed for this uh, French singer named Soko. Um, right on. Uh, but yeah, I came to LA to, um, to, I mean, I guess I was lucky in that I did a lot of touring last year and was planning on taking this year time off anyway, time off from the, the touring thing and, um, to pursue like more soundtrack work. And then I wanted to do, some, you know, get into some extra work, um, you know, in video and film, yeah. and, and then uh, <clears throat> hopefully some like fashion stuff. Um, Gilbert also uh, used an Earth, or no, Dylan, one of my solo tracks uh, for this Gucci uh, thing he did. It was like they he they had him film this. Uh, I guess it it wasn't like a. It was at LACMA, I guess. It was some kind of event, some Gucci event. But he filmed it, and, and then they, um, and then he said, "Oh, I want to use this music," um, and they okayed it. So. Oh, it's great. And then, and then I did a photo shoot when I first got here that was in that Love magazine yeah. from the UK um, with. Um, the photographer's named Rich Green. I guess he works a lot uh, with Gucci and fashion stuff. But that was with um, Gilbert and uh, his girlfriend Arrow, who's the singer of Starcrawler, and then this girl Danny, who's in a band called Surfboard. And she also, I believe, models for Gucci. Um, when are you gonna give me some free Gucci shit? <laughs> well, I haven't gotten any. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yeah, so it, I mean, that's it was like when I first came down here. Obviously, stuff was still happening. Yeah, right. There was lots was of stuff like, lined up. Yeah. Where'd yeah. you move from? Uh, Seattle. Right. Where. Um, I mean, that kind of stuff just doesn't really happen. Yeah, totally. Happen there. Um, but you do get wet yeah. continuously. Did you miss getting wet? Uh, no, that's one of the main reasons I came <laughs> down here. And last year, it was so dark in Seattle. It was like the darkest winter on record. Like Physically dark. Yeah, like, right. like it was really dark. Like, And then, I mean, I was really exhausted. <laughs> At the end of the last tour, like, I had some, I mean, there were some personal issues I was going It just through. seemed like time to bail. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd just been touring pretty much nonstop for the last right. five years. I mean, between Earth and my solo stuff and collaboration with The Bug and, like, um, so, um, and, like, and also... Because, I mean, touring has changed now. It's not like the old days where, like, the more you toured, the better it got. Yeah, right. It's like, now you have to tour really, like, strategically. Yep. Some, yeah, sometimes it's more lucrative to do less shows. Yeah, to yep. wait and, and, and hold off. And then also... Um, I mean, it's kind of better that way, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean... Um, and then, so... When you do solo shows, it's just literally solo. Usually, I mean, I've done I've done some projects where I've had like a drummer and me, or 
I did one with a drummer and a singer uh, for this, like one of my uh, D.R. Carlson Albion projects that was like English songs, like folk, uh, not all folk right, songs, right. but mostly folk songs, but also like songs about England. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I also do like my last record, solo record with, that was under just my name. Uh, was just even though on the record I played with um, Emma, Ruth Rundle, and my wife at the time uh, did percussion. Um, uh, that when I toured it, it was yeah just me on guitar. Um, Don's made a couple of badass records with the Bug, Kevin. Yeah, that's right. I know. Yeah, that. and then we did some shows. Um, we did sort of a tour, uh, but that was more like fly-ins and stuff rather than like hitting the road in a van type thing. When are you, when you going to pitch what we've been working on? <laughs> and then, uh, well, we it's there's also a project in the offing that is intended for the next road burn that... Um, is me, Mark, and uh, David Edwards from Woven Hand. Um, yeah. And me and Mark have worked on some material for it. Um, and I'm going to have to steal the best part <laughs> of that material from my next <laughs> yeah, I no. to tell. Well, I mean, we it's kind of, you know, we're still sort of unsure if, like, Roadburn's gonna happen. Yeah, sure. You're looking for a purpose, and, right? And stuff. So it's like, I mean, that's why we did it. We figured that way we'd have some material, and if it happens, cool. If not, then we can right. do something else with it, or Mark can do something with it, or you know, whatever. It's like <coughs> to have just. I only, only had one uh, conversation with David Eugene Edwards too. Yeah, uh, that was before all this stuff, and he was into it then, but then. Yeah, I haven't heard. Everything is. You know, I haven't talked to him. Yeah, or I haven't talked to him since. Yeah, in a while, let's say. Um, a couple of those tunes are hot. Yeah. Yeah. They're gonna sound really good on my record. But. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been fun because we've both been kind of doing. Things that are not. Typical. Typical or what we're known for, I guess you could say. Um, it, it was kind of our deal going in. Yeah, but it wasn't going to be. Well, yeah, you got to keep yourself interested. Yeah. But, um, and then uh, I was supposed to do some shows this year that were going to be uh me and uh my wife who were separated but um we're we we're gonna work on some stuff together she's a dancer um and we're gonna do some i was gonna play conquistador which is my solo album with uh emma playing as well and holly dancing to it, that was all another thing I was gonna do for Roadburn, and then uh, Earth is supposed to do like sort of a retrospective show for Roadburn oh, as cool. well. Um, obviously, those were canceled, and they said they're rolling right. the lineup over <clears throat> till next year, but who knows? Yeah, who knows? Yeah. At the time, it seemed like oh yeah, things will be back by April next year, and now it's like. Yeah, sure. I don't think there's going to be a next year. Yeah, I don't. Um, yeah, we have a t we have a tour February outlined, but yeah. there's no fucking way. Yeah, it's just becoming like no one knows. It's like you know, uh, I mean, and then like the big companies, like um, I mean, not that we play, but like Live Nation. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But. I mean, Live Nation had pandemic insurance, so they can. Yeah, right. They're not in any hurry to do anything. Right. At this point, since they're getting paid for everything. Right. That got canceled. Um, it's like 
it's like they're smart and good at it or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, they apparently them and Wimbledon were the only two people that had wow. pandemic insurance, wow. but the cost was outrageous. Like, I, bet. The, I don't know how much Live Aids was, but or Live Nation, <laughs> Live Aid, <laughs> living in the eighties. <laughs> Uh, Respect. Uh, Wimbledon, I think, was paying two million a year for this. for this insurance for the last however many years. Wow! And you know now they get it all back. Uh, yeah, now they're getting a big chunk, right. but still, like, no, who else is gonna? Yeah, right. No one. No one else Jesus can afford Christ. a two million dollar. I'm gonna fire all my people. Premium, or whatever. Giving me pandemic insurance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, I told you. Oh my god, man. Yeah. It's fucking wild. Do you, yeah. think there's a, do you think there's any point in like, like are you releasing music right now? Or are you stockpiling no, I stuff? Mean, I, I, I mean, I mean, I... Like, do you have stuff that you had planned to put out prior or during No, because we had just released a new right. record last year or so. Um, and I kind of like what I, at least what I write for me or Earth, it's kind of like I know that something's due and that sure, money's right. just writing on it. <laughs> totally. <laughs> or being spent. So, so it's, are you saying it's hard to be productive without yeah, those outlines? Yeah, I mean, totally. I'm, I've been finding it hard. Yeah, right. Because, I mean, I it's kind of like, I mean, I don't want to sound like totally mercenary, but like, I realized, like, this has made me realize how tied to, I guess, the fact that I make a living at it now, how, like, my relationship is different to it, where, like, I'm right. productive when I know yeah. it's something's at stake, and when totally. I'm left to my own devices, I'm, like... I mean, I think well, well you you could you can overthink it too. Like yeah. I put out my own music, mm-hmm. and like you'd think that would come with more freedom, but I actually prefer having like what you're saying, an outline, a budget, yeah, someone else pissed or involved, or, yeah, you know, like I I need yeah. that sort of fire, yeah, you know, and I I think I mean I also think part of it still too that, like. You know, like I was really exhausted yeah. in December, and like, not only was it dark weather-wise, I was in a pretty dark spot right. that I'm just coming out of. So I feel like that might have something to do with it as well. And right. I'm still like working finding, through that. Yeah. Finding my feet again in in a changed world change situation and then i went through a phase where i would only work if i had something to do you know i would only write if i had a due date yeah yeah and then um and then i got on the schedule where i was for a long time i was doing stuff for other people or with other people a lot of collaborative stuff and then I got on a schedule where I was just putting out my own music. Mm-hmm. And it was like, I had to have a record every other year. So, you know, I, I would write a record while I was touring a record. And then I was recording it as soon as I got back. And just... Uh, you set your own timeline. Yeah. And I also i am still like I'm supposed to do something tomorrow. You know, it's I always got these... Not huge paying jobs, but these one-off things. Yeah, like irons a, in the fire kind of thing. Yeah, I got this I'm, I'm narrating some Australian TV thing and doing something for a movie that was supposed to happen tomorrow. Um, but it turns out that I didn't have to make a schedule because I'd always have something happening. Yeah. Right. And that's why I like it, too. Like, you know, when I... We didn't have to like work on tunes. No, I get off on like yeah. Fucking, that's what I enjoy. Is, like, yeah, sure. The other creating. Um, yeah, I, I feel lucky that way. That's what I most enjoy. Yeah. Why well, I, I also find uh, I like George. Um, I like kind of being like a session guy. 
where it's sure. like someone else's Less project, person. Yeah, totally. and like they want me to do this, yeah, you know, right. or just come play guitar, or like... How do you differentiate making a solo song versus an earth track? Um, <clears throat> the way it's kind of come out is sort of... I always... W- I always want to leave Earth free to change and do something different with each record. And so um, I guess the genesis of me doing the solo stuff was back in, I guess, 2010, 2011, when we did the Angels of Darkness records. Like, at that point, I was, like, that's when I was really obsessed with, like, uh, English folk music, like, the electric folk music of that, of the, you know, like, the, um, you know, like, Fairport Convention, that kind of stuff. And then also, yeah, Yeah. Pentangle, like, all that kind of stuff. Like, that was sort of my musical obsession at the time. Incredible string band. And then, and then I was also really obsessed with, uh, like English occult folklore and, uh, and, and so that was a big influence on that earth record. And because I was still obsessed with it, I didn't want the next, especially because we did two records in that session like we did enough material yeah, right. and then we released it as two separate records but i didn't want to do a third record with those influences yeah, right. so that's when i broke off and did the solo the solo thing because i it was like oh i'm still into this stuff and I'm, i want to do more with it but i don't want to saddle earth with it yeah right three in a row is like defining yeah. Yeah. Totally. And so, yeah, and then, you know, the next Earth record was Primitive and Deadly, which was, like, sort of super metal and, like, returned to, like, my metal kid years, influence-wise. Um, you have a favorite Earth release? Um, without, like, it, without naming, like, the most recent or something? Those records are, I love a lot, I think, because of like at the time I basically thought I was going to die right and so I thought that was might be the last earth record right so that's why it was a such lot a went into it, yeah. session and 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 a lot of good things came out of those records and and so those ones yeah are pretty close to my heart um it's weird primitive and deadly the songs are really close to my heart because uh at the time i did that record was right after i met my wife and right before we got married so she inspired right. a lot of the songs but the recording of the record was uh, difficult um because of you know shitty manager label right right all the bullshit yeah just there was a lot of bullshit around those right that record um and then also it was cool because like mark sang on it right and and stuff so like there was a lot of it was like i loved the songs but then like so much bullshit happened around it right it kind of soured it a bit yeah yeah totally yeah which is too bad like um what about like early shows that earth would play like you did you you couldn't have ever played with bands that sounded somewhere no because it didn't exist yeah no i mean back in the early days like in the sub pop years i mean we didn't play a lot of live we weren't a right. super live band back then um i mean not like 
I mean, part of it was the, you know, drug use and whatnot like that. We weren't really a touring band. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, we didn't play with, there weren't like, you know. Right, there was nothing to compare it to. Yeah. Um, so did it, do you, did it work to the audience? I mean, it's weird. When we first started, like, people, like, hated it. Sure. Like, you know, we were, like, it was sort of, like, I mean, not everybody, but for the most part, it was, like, generally a negative response. <laughs> right. <in> life. <laughs> right. It's the best. Um, <laughs> right. Like, like, I remember, like, we opened for some metal band, and, like, it was, like, all these metal dudes, like, flipping me off the whole right. show. And, and right. One guy screaming "fuck you" at me the whole night, <laughs> right. and then like, um, and then <laughs> I think one of the most hilarious was when I did a opening slot for the Lemonheads, right? And then like, <laughs> I the the half the audience was were just so confused they didn't know how to react, and then like san diego there was just so much stuff flying at the right just violence yeah right um i guess like kind of like suicides tour with the cars, cars yeah <laughs> yeah Those videos are great but um but yeah so i mean we weren't really a live thing so much back then although actually we did do one show opening for the trees at the hub um where Joe Preston started a song over is that uh, it was when we were using a drum machine and so it had a foot switch right, to start it time. and like he was like glumping around the stage and like halfway through this 25 minute song he hit the, <laughs> hit the foot switch and it started over so it was like <laughs> punishment <laughs> right. uh, but uh <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I feel like we were, I feel like when we became a touring band was like, when we came back and like. Is that like with the first like Southern Lord record back? We or? actually started touring before our first tour was 2003. Okay. Um, we had this guy who was a complete shyster, uh, it said he had a label, um, which we later found out he was, it was early days of eBay and he was selling this computer that didn't exist over and over and over wow. again. And that's how he was financing it. So he later went to <clears throat> prison for wire fraud. Um, and uh, so, <laughs> so he had this grand idea to re release Earth 2 in like a, God, was it four vinyl? Oh, crazy. Edition. Yeah, it was like, it was ridiculous. Because I remember I got that CD yeah. around then, 2003 or four. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we had some stuff on uh, a No Quarter, yeah, I knew, which was I lived okay. in Philly at the time. Yeah, that, that guy, that guy was okay. But the Auto Fat guy was just a total... This was a total scam. Yeah, and so we show up in Europe and like... It's the first show in London... And we're picking up the entire pressing of like 3,000 records <laughs> right. with, you know, like, and yeah, it was yeah. like, people were like, what is wrong with you? What like, you, you aren't right. like, there's no way you're going to sell 3,000 records on this tour. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. but we figured out it's because he'd written bad checks to the pressing plant and to all these right. people. So he wanted the, all the products. So, so when the checks bounced. Right. Like, and, uh. Of course, that backfired because, like, you know, like when it would take time came to go to Switzerland, people are like, "You, there's no you way you in, can yeah. bring this in," and right. so, you know, we had to dump it all all over Europe. Jesus and then Christ! The the last show was at this club in Paris that was right on the border of the ninety third, um, which was the Algerian neighborhood that later blew up. Jesus. when there was all the riots right. but so i think the that pressing is ended up melted in the basement because wow. that club was part of the area that burned oh my god but, right. um but yeah at the end of that tour we basically had to like 
put this guy up against the wall, take our rent, pay the driver, and then bail. Yeah, right. And like leave all this vinyl in the basement to melt. of this jazz club in Paris. <laughs> um, but and then the next tour, like our next tour, was this was when we were on Southern Lord for Hex, and that most of the money from that tour went to paying back like the backline company, the band, right? You know, all right, the right. debts that were left from. But from that tour, but um, Paris yeah. is burning. Yeah. Yeah. The, so the 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 restart was a bit rocky. <laughs> right. Three no, entry is a bitch. Like, they say. I don't know about this. Right? Yeah. No, three no follower. I mean, when I re when I started playing music again back, it, it was like two thousand one. Um, like I wasn't planning on starting Earth again. Right. I just hadn't had a guitar in like four years five years yeah it was just gonna play again and 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 then it sort of snowballed i guess um this guy i was working at a frame shop and these two guys came in and were like Is, are you doing carlson and i was like who wants to know um <laughs> that same with stan working no, no, this is in Seattle. Um, but uh, and that was Randall Dunn, and that's who came in to see, yeah, and John Schuler. And they were like, Oh, do you want to do an Earth show? And I was like, And I'd been playing music with Adrian, um, and so we were like, Sure, why not? And so that was sort of when. <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and then, and then we did a. Greg invited us to do the south, this like showcase at South by Southwest, um, with some Southern Lord stuff, um, and that was when. Uh, I guess we signed to Southern Lord, and that's where Hex came from, and then. Obviously, did a bunch of stuff for them and, until relations soured, <laughs> um, and then, and then, and then, yeah, right. And then, basically, I was looking for new management because the last, uh, like, for five years, we had an amazing manager, Clyde Peterson, uh, and then. Um, this total shyster again that I had the misfortune of working with for a year um, at the end, um, but uh, and then that I had that's how I had met Kathy because we we did a show with uh, Marriages and Death Heaven in L.A. and that's when I first met Kathy, and then um, basically had a couple dinners or with her like meetings dinners and uh you know obviously the band she dealt with all really spoke highly of her and right and then we were at dinner and we realized like that we had the same like knew a lot of the same people in the industry and had the same opinions of them so it was, like, right it made like, sense so yeah, and so Kathy became uh, my manager, Earth's manager, and and then uh, then I did the solo record, sort of, as to see like how it went, and because like I guess just you know to mix it up. Well, I, and I, because I knew it would be a while before we had a next Earth album. Oh, that was the first one you did with the new. Yeah, with Kathy. Okay, got it. Conquistador, because, you know, we had just changed management. We had just left. Right, right. Southern Lord. Um, so it was like I knew it would be a little while before an Earth record. Yeah, right. Sort of come out. And so I was like, oh, well, I've got this material and I'd like to do a record, you know, do a solo record. Um, and then that worked really well, and and it was great. Emma's an amazing musician, and uh, 
and then and then yeah and then we just were like yeah let's do the record next earth record and let's do it just you know kathy's already our manager she's got a label everything she does is like transparent and like straight up and like no bullshit and like no multi-album contracts and like you know it's just like right record by record after so much bullshit yeah after, yeah yeah especially yeah from southern lord um and uh and yeah and i'm really that record i'm really fond of i mean i really like the, the latest record a lot um, it's great yeah it's awesome real real i think it's a real high point and i feel very good about it um and it was fun just like playing bass and guitar on it and like as much as it was enjoyable to have like the extra musicians on the previous albums it was cool to just yeah know, be like your record stripped down yeah that's cool i love i have still have a copy of that divine and bright seven inch oh yeah that's a great song yeah that was the that was from our first sessions that we did in Portland that uh, originally the originally Sub Pop approached us about doing a seven inch and that's why the song uh, Bureaucratic for Desire Bureaucratic Desire for Revenge got split into two parts because it was okay. supposed to be an A and a B side and right. they decided oh let's do a CD single instead and so right. it was like two long songs but that we did a bunch more material Okay, and that's where Divine and Bright uh, was that was like my pop song <laughs> it's good I've DJed it a few times so, yeah it was like little, little Johnny Jewel part one and two the television single I had. Oh yeah. Right. It just fades down at the end yeah. of the side one and the fade fades back up. up. Yeah. And it was worth like 150 bucks already when I was in, in junior high school. And then I fucking was trying to kill a rat with a fire poker. <laughs> and I busted it in half oh, no. on the ground. That's Steve ended up Slayer did this thing. It's gonna be a seven T P for Southern Lord. I did the liner notes for it. Oh cool. But that's the picture of his drum set. Oh, cool. It's kind of a memorial to him. He did this hardcore thing with, you know, Ian Watts and Mike I X and mm -hmm. Blaine Cook and Oliveri. But, uh, you know, it's old school hardcore and Steve Slayer, you know, yeah. played the drums and sang. And, yeah. Dude, you're still badass at 50. But, uh, yeah. I did it, even though it wasn't so. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. They just sent me this picture. Do you remember some of the records that were were stolen from him that he took from? Oh yeah, <laughs> shitloads of the oh, first really? Nirvana single. Oh yeah, like the most expensive ones. That's what we'd send him in to get. Where could you sell those at the time? Just stores or? The, well, there was Cellophane Square. But like, would but... they pay like top dollar for rare? Yeah, yeah right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, and then there was Singles Going Steady. Was that? That was the place down on Fruit. Like, well, yeah, in but, Belltown yeah. that did. They specialized in seven inches, so they they would do good money and so they were happy to see you guys well they were happy to see Dylan this they never got to see me because I was the yeah. most uh I was the most famous of the three of us so <laughs> right, I couldn't right. be walking in yeah. the stores yeah I'd right. send Dean to yeah. do the dirty work the bad man. <laughs> I, I told Slayer what to get and then when he got it I would accompany Dylan down to the store and then wait outside and what did he them. get for taking them Slayer yeah he get a third of it right right well well, we got a piece. Drugs. We got a piece of whatever, <laughs> whatever we were right, right. Whatever drugs right. were acquired, it wasn't that a really a cash you know, economy <laughs> right, between right. the three of us. <laughs> I mean, we had our own business of making a certain drug, and then we also <laughs> bought a certain drug, and then we also had a business where we scored drugs for customers, and that's when my divide with Slayer happened after so many years. Yeah. When he uh, stole our cash cow, we had this, <laughs> we had this guy from Boeing, like some 
50, yeah. some guy in his 50s would pull up every day and he would want three kinds of drugs, including the one that we made and sold him, and then two other kinds and had, took had me and him to go get them. And then he would also give us a hundred bucks yeah. on top of it. And we would take, you know, yeah. half the bag. Yeah, right. To, Whose idea was it to start this business and to start making? Well, it had been my business for a while. I just, yeah, think just became kinda... known as a guy and people would start showing up and I could get it. Yeah, yeah right. It's just being the guy that could score. And uh, but that guy we got from Slayer's cousin, who was an escort. And she met him on her job and then turned him over to us. And every <laughs> she morning, pimped him out. Yeah, <laughs> right. She pimped him out. <laughs> right. And then he would show up every morning and honk the horn. And we'd go down. And then one day he didn't show up and Slayer just had some sort of, you know, some... Some uh, story. Yeah, somewhere he had to go and then didn't show back up again and didn't take a <laughs> Einstein to figure out what right. happened. <laughs> and I got the I got Mikey and David the air trains. I put out a hundred dollars crack bounty on him. <laughs> right. I think they could tell me where Slayer was. Yeah. I could give him hundred bucks worth of crack. I was gonna kill Slayer. <laughs> I didn't see him again for five or six years and then I see him it's out he's outside a tree show crying at the yeah at the chain link fence. Look. <laughs> and like somebody's like, is that your boyfriend out there? I'm like, Jesus <laughs> Christ, I need to right, get, get out of here. Get him in here. <laughs> right. Just bring him in. Just get him in here. <laughs> He gets in there. He's, I'm sorry. I'm like, God damn it. Right. You know, just, you have to cry at the gate. <laughs> <laughs> I had to forgive him. He was like, he was like my brother, the brother that you fight with continuously. <laughs> <laughs> but in the last year, he, he went to prison for like six, seven years. Um, but for the last year, two years, he's been out every day. Text, funny photos, you yeah. know, funny text. He was, he was a really talented guy, really yeah. great, great musician, and you know, one of a kind character. Eight feet tall, beautiful, long, luxurious blonde <laughs> hair. <laughs> <laughs> but he got through prison by starting a uh, music program there and teaching Crazy, con yeah. convicts how to play and record. That's they cool. Had to let him do that. Yeah. So he had. He had he had a lot more balls than we gave him credit for in the day. But yeah, shocking. Just <laughs> whatever, a month ago. Yeah. Was that sudden? Yeah, it yes. was just like out of the blue. And like he didn't know he was sick or anything like that? Well, he just had a massive heart attack. Okay. And it was it was like five hours after you'd sent me a text. Yeah. Oh, fuck, right. Yeah. Because he would text me in the morning, like early in the morning, I think when he'd be getting off work as an engineer, like five in the morning, right when I'd go to bed, he'd yeah. always text me. And then I think you'd had a phone call with him the day before or something. Yep, I did do that too. Right. That's right. Yeah. Because he was working a lot with Nick and they wanted me to do stuff with him. But. So what's next? You guys are doing the Galaxy 500 cover. Doing that uh, Friday, I believe. That was, by the way, the, that was Brendan O'Brien and George Druculius oh. called me on that fucking conference call. So the big wigs yeah. got a hold of me. <laughs> and they want me to acapella the Woody Guthrie thing wow. to them on the phone when we're done here. So wow. that they figure out how what key I'm going to do it in. I just said, do it in the key it's going to happen in. But yeah. anyway, then I'm supposed to do that tomorrow. And then, so the day after, right? That's Friday. Friday, yeah. That's the day we're doing yeah. our Galaxy 500 thing. And it's going to fucking rock. We're going to, like, play it hardcore style. <laughs> it's funny. I'm surrounded by people that want me to play fast. Like my, my housemate, Graham, has been doing this, some music stuff. And he's always like, can we get it faster? And I'm just like... <laughs> Have you not heard what yeah, I do? Like, do you know who I am? Yeah. <laughs> fast <laughs> tell him dude i invented slow <laughs> yeah i have one good idea and i've been around right. with it ever since <laughs> slow you never take my time with it <laughs> dude i found it when he was inventing that slow style i found it so soothing yeah it put me to sleep 
<laughs> on the third floor, and, and I would wake up in the bed and moved across. The, <laughs> well, the futon had moved all the way across the room. Back when I had the ridiculous amount of amplification. It was so, f I mean. Your neighbors? We did, but we were far enough uh, away, yeah, and it was Seattle, right. and no one gave a fuck back then. And our biggest neighbor was a business. Yeah. It was a candy shop. Yeah. And um, the other two, two... candy shops next to each other. <laughs> the, the, the other two houses were bigger dives yeah. than ours. Yeah. I just feel like Seattle was less anal back then, too. It was before the whole yeah, it was, tech thing, and all the people like that wanted... The illusion of being around music, but then once they were actually around it, like would do noise complaints. Right, right totally. Like, like my favorite was <laughs> there was this condo they built, and the lobby had like guitars in it. Right. And like their ad campaign was all about you know being next to like you know music venues and right. nightlife and all that and then the, everyone that lived in that building was like constantly calling in noise right, complaints right. on like <laughs> any menu or like right. in the area it was just like fuck you people like yeah it was seattle was still really like it just a uh what year did that change uh, after the fucking grunge explosion yeah like That's when it started to like late 90s did the tech move and that collide it was yeah sometime? i mean basically there was right. there was the first tech bubble and in the night i guess it was the 90s late 90s yeah. the early 2000s like the first tech bubble that just blew up and then was gone like i mean it, it was like so funny like i knew so many people that were like Oh, they were making six figures and they had a condo and they bought a new car and we're just like, oh, my startup and I've got tax or not right. or stock options. And like everyone was just like throwing money around and then boom, God. it was gone. Yeah, and they wow. were all like, you know, selling their house and their car and leaving town. Um, like I'm doing. And then... <laughs> And then the real, you know, obviously the the big players that were there from the start became, you know. The rich became richer. Yeah, Amazon, Google, whatever, Microsoft, all like, you know, they obviously didn't go away and just keep, kept, or keep right. metastasizing. And now, like, they own Seattle. Um I mean, Seattle is just a completely different city now. Like, um, it's just, yeah, it's not even the same city. I mean, when, when the whole grunge boom happened, like, I mean, Seattle only had like 500,000 people. Right. And, wow. You know, and now it's like 2 million and then however many in the county. But um, like five, it's like people you'd see moving there just because of music. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. right, yeah. right. All I time. mean, music is what put Seattle on the map. Actually, brought a ton of money to this city. Brought more than biotech. Um, but of course, you know that took over, right? Yeah, right. No one wanted to hear about that once it was over, and then. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I remember when... Like, did rent start going up and stuff like that? Yeah, everything right, right. changed, yeah. you know? Like, before everyone knew someone that had a house with a basement and right. could practice it, and, you know, and then soon it was like, oh, you have to get a practice space, and the practice space just kept going up and up. Um, but, I mean, I, I remember when... Like, all of a sudden, there was like, oh, this band from Seattle. And everyone was like, they're not from Seattle. Right, We've right. never seen them. Right. Whereas, like, all the bands that were from Seattle, you saw them at the same parties, the same shows, around town, you know. Right. Like, you knew they were. Yeah, yeah. There was, and then all of a sudden, like, oh, Candlebox. It's like, where the fuck did these guys come from? Right. Like, Bellevue. You know, and like... 
<laughs> and then like, I mean, I still remember the very first article in the NME about Seattle and it opened with the line, Seattle, an obscure West Coast seaport. Right. And that was the view of Seattle. Right, you know? right, right. Like it was like nowhere. Though. Right. Um, obscure. Yeah. Seaport. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was the view of Seattle. And then I, it's funny, I think about another nugget of Seattle history that I love is um, at the time Back in Black came out, um, Seattle had 350,000 people in it, I guess, at the time. And that album sold 300,000 copies in Seattle. Wow. So that means wow. almost everyone Fuck. in Seattle owns Black and Black. Wow. <laughs> Asher Capital. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> I saw them on that tour. And then, like, there's that famous picture from the show in Seattle on that tour where there's, like, the Hesher guy holding up a shirt that says, Kill a Punk for Rock and Roll. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> I mean, I remember when I moved to Seattle from New Jersey and like, I guess it was 84, 85. And, like, I mean, there were still people rocking, like, elephant bells and, like, <laughs> the feathered hair and like you know it was not um it was not hip right <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination <laughs> there's that photo on the internet of you two with kurt in drag what yeah that was actually what's, the night the night before the yeah, meeting what's, with that's, bruce <laughs> that's right right that's, <laughs> that's where we were busy burying bodies yeah um no, it was funny. We were at some fancy hotel that Kurt was staying at, and like it was the morning, and we're leaving to go to the meeting. And we get on the elevator, and I look around, and I realize we're surrounded by hotel security, like <laughs> making sure we're like leaving. And then apparently they kicked in the door and like threw Kurt and Courtney out. <laughs> five minutes after we left the building <laughs> we'd be making a bit of noise at yeah. night <laughs> and you were let go the next day and we were just we were on our way to make more noise at our yeah no we meeting. were dropped after that meeting yeah. somehow no, uh, it was a couple of years yeah so okay I, I got dropped first yeah you were kept on because yeah i actually trail. resigned after the debacle of phase three <laughs> which surprised the hell out of me I didn't resign till 2000, no, till 98. Mm. Again, the only label it would take me. Yeah, I was in my lost years in 98. How long have we been doing this for? Probably have some, probably have some stuff, right? Recorded? Oh yeah, fuck yeah. Are yeah. you kidding me? We got hours. <laughs> We've got hours of stuff. Blocked out. Hours of insane.